Welcome to Sinister Image. I'm very pleased this evening to give you a special treat. Uh, as you know, I have done cult cinema before, but I feel that this show is very special because I have two very special guests. Uh, first, I have perhaps the most successful independent filmmaker in the business, Mr. Russ Meyer, and Yvette Vickers, whom my genre fans will know from Attack of the 50-Foot Woman and the Giant Leeches. But what many of you did not know is that Ms. Vickers uh, was photographed by Russ Meyer for Playboy magazine at about the time she was making these films. So for the next half hour, I'm going to get into the career of Russ Meyer, and I hope you'll get some surprises out of it. Now, Russ, thank you so much for being a guest. And to start off with, um, I'd like to get into the World War II experience you had as a photographer that led to you getting into film? Uh, Best time of my life. World War II, the last good war. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, you were in the same company with George Stevens and John Huston. I mean, they were all... No, no, he, no Huston was in, uh, in Italy. Mm -hmm. And uh, George Stevens, uh, I ran across him a couple of times. He uh, was an ETO, but I wasn't part of his elite uh, Hollywood group. Oh, boy. We were just uh, attached to the foot sloggers, like in the infantry and armored divisions. But now these experiences are going to be part of your, the current project you're working on, which is your, your, your uh, opus. The monster movie, yeah, 17 and a half hours. My God. I've been on it for some five years, and uh, I, I, I got out of it because I just kind of got fed up with the thing. I've been so long on the job, and I turned to uh, writing an autobiographical book, which is taken up all my time these last two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Now, from World War II, when did you get involved with Playboy from that point? to go Because you were photographing uh, models during World War II, and then I guess this kind of led to... No, uh, I, uh, I shot a French hooker, but uh, she wasn't <laughs> a model. But, uh, no, I, I really didn't know much about still photography until uh, a fellow by the name of Don Ornitz, who was a very famous photojournalist, uh, put me onto it because there were a lot of uh, skin magazines, they called them in those days, that were coming out and mm -hmm. uh, offered me an opportunity to shoot women, so I did. I shot a lot of girls and then I married um, Eve Meyer who became one of the earliest playmates. And uh, I shot a lot of people and this is how uh, I came to meet uh, Yvette here. It was through Globe Photos, Charles Block. Oh boy. And uh, I did a number of uh, independent f shootings of her and it appeared in uh, the photo, one, one was a part of a, a, a compilation of many photographs that I made. And then um, when Hefner um, was presented with some of these shots, he uh, went for Yvette very much, very strongly. And we shot uh, the Playmate, the centerfold as it were, in um, my uh, living room up on uh, Evanview Drive. I can recall having to go out and get a Swedish modern Sofa. They were a lot simpler in those days. Today, I imagine they're a real production. Well, I have a surprise. Yvette very kindly brought down a couple of photographs that she had that you had taken. If we could look at those, and maybe you might uh, reminisce a little about uh, that shoot, if you can remember. Okay, Yvette, you very kindly brought these pictures. Could you kind of reminisce a little about the one on the monitor now? Well. I, uh, I'm going to embarrass you, Russ. All of our sessions were just fantastic. I loved working with him. He came in his army boots and it looked like a marine sergeant. He was so gentle and sweet and so kind. Very easy to work with. And I felt so relaxed that I think he got shoots of me that were unique and better than anyone else that ever shot me. And a lot of photographers were interested at that time. I did a lot of shoots. but. Russ was my favorite, still is. I think that uh, it's just, he captured a lot of things about me. And he made me feel free to be that way, to oh, relax. That's, that's a beautiful photograph. Now, did you bring, you. is there another one out there in color, I think? There we go. Now, was this done around that the same time? That is similar. That is a similar uh, pose to the centerfold. And uh, I love. I loved this too. I remember sometimes if I didn't have quite the right expression, Russ would say, say Paul, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a French, <laughs> Paul. <laughs> and, uh, 
But in general, he just let me go, you know, just let me move around and be free. And uh, I just loved working with him. They were great sessions. I always felt terrific after we'd been shooting and just, you know, like a performance, like a really an acting performance. Well, they're very sexy, too, which... Yeah, I don't know how he did that. I mean, I, he brought that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, from working at Playboy, of course, the film that that you did that I suppose was the, the landmark that started the whole ball rolling was the Immoral Mr. T's, which I think you told me was made for something like, what was it, 26? 24,000. 24,000 yeah, yeah. and made over three or six million? Well, it grossed in excess of two million dollars. That was when tickets were a dollar and a half, too. Uh, well, before we talk about it, let's have a look at a sequence from Russ Meyer's The Immoral Mr. T's. Modern man must, in the course of his endeavors, always keep his eyes on the future. For who knows how the windy zephyrs of fate may twist and cross two lives. clip must, uh, in, in, for audiences now, it seems so tame, but I remember in 5960 when this and Fellini's La Dolce Vita came out, it was like banned, uh, you know, and there was all this uproar about uh, pornography, but it's, there, it's really quite a charming film, and it addresses itself to, you know, male fantasies in uh, a way at that time that I suppose was tantalizing without I mean, they're really very innocent pictures, and sometimes your reputation doesn't seem to be, it's kind of ill-deserved because... Oh, it's well-deserved. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, the clip where we saw it was an alternate clip because uh, there we were, I was advised we couldn't show any nudity. Yeah, that was a surprise yeah, to yeah. me as well. Um, this was Bill Tease, a, a very good photographer, still, still living, was much older than myself. He was in service with me, and uh, we did it in four days cost uh, $24,000. Four days. And it opened up the floodgates of permissiveness, as we know it in these United States today. It was a quote from Time Magazine. I was glad to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us the quote that uh, you were telling me last night about Roger Ebert on your, on your tombstone. They were the, the fellow from... Uh, oh, Charles Keating in Citizens for Decent Literature. He's the man behind most of this kind of... these rumbles, you know. Mm. He's in Mises' back pocket. Um, they said, uh, he, he, apparently, uh, Keating did say at one time that I was more responsible than any other, any other person in the United States for uh, you know, sort of breaking down the moral fiber of the United States and the people, of course, therein. And I, I replied, uh, I was glad, glad to do it. To do it. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, you know, if you think back in those days, you know, we even had the Legion of Decency, so when the moon is blue and pictures like Baby Doll, anything, in fact, Tennessee Williams had made into a film, immediately got a C rating. Uh -huh. And it's just taken years for, you know, all of that to fall on the wayside. But honestly, I suppose The Immoral Mr. T's was the very beginning of 
It was the first one. It was, it was an offshoot of my doing some layouts for Playboy at that time. They were into the, the girl next door and the voyeurism, the dirty old man latching at women, uh, looking at uh, ladies and uh, the hoping coat. that the clothes yeah. uh, would dissolve and come off. So this is what this was all about, was Bill Tees, uh, and he would fantasize and dream, or not dream, but he would uh, kind of lapse off into something and, and uh, find himself uh, dealing with something that would be uh, completely uh, uh, in opposition to what he had just seen beforehand, the girl fully clothed. Goes to a psychiatrist, it's a very simple thing, but it was so, uh, you know, uh, outrageous for that time. I mean, to see that much nudity and to deal with a man who was a voyeur, who was letching at women. Heretofore, they, they didn't have anything of that nature. Prior to that, there were these notice, nudist camp pictures with, you know, people purposely selected with bad bodies. So they wouldn't run afoul of uh, people that were supposedly uh, uh, letching like Mr. T's. And they'd always walk off into the sunset with a little tad, you know, always mm -hmm. from the back. Or they'd be playing water polo and things of that nature. Well, you know, and he really was very respectable in a way. He just fantasized the way men do, I suppose, at that time when they read Playboy. Because that's what Playboy was for, you know, it was a magazine mm -hmm. for fantasies. And the women in it were beautiful, and they weren't the kind of women that you would see at the supermarket. Although, in Hollywood, that's not necessarily <laughs> true. But, uh, now, from Mr. T's to, uh, now Lorna really was the, the film that, uh, like it was a bigger grocer than Mr. T's, wasn't it? But Well, uh, first of all, um, there are five films that I've done out of the 22 that were kind of landmarks. Landmark, I mean, yeah. Tees opened up the floodgates, as I said. Uh, then Lorna, uh, after I had imitated myself some six times with films like Even the Handyman, Erotica, Heavenly Bodies, mm -hmm. Wild Gals, and The Naked West, and so <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I knew I had to do something else, and I was influenced by the Italian masters, you know, De Sica, Antonioni, and so forth, and um, Bitter Rice. That was, uh, that was one I was very taken with. And I thought, well, why can't I do a bit of rice here in the States? Instead of going to Italy, we'll do it in the San Joaquin Valley in the Sacramento River. Uh, the big problem was finding a girl that was outrageously abundant, uh, which is always uh, some difficulty involved in finding people of that nature. I finally advertised in Variety, and I got one girl to show up. Her name was Barbara Popejoy, and we renamed her Lorna Maitland. And, uh, and she was the film. You know, without her, it wouldn't have really amounted to a Tinker's Dam. Mm -hmm. But she was so remarkable uh, that uh, it was strictly box office. Now, how often after these were released here did they get? Did they go to Europe? I mean, did you have a large European following after the first six? No, no, not really. Uh, Lorna was successful, but it was handled by a charlatan in France, and I never got a nickel out of it. You know, but they you did always get over felt there. yeah, yeah did, but you fall prey to these people. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't really happen until uh, much later in my career, when I really t took over the distribution, the mm -hmm. overseeing of my films in Europe, whereby I would go over and do a lot of press hype and so forth and get good distributors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I can go back to uh, the, more rec the most recent film, Beneath the Valley of the Ultra Vixens. It's been playing now in Germany for eight years. Like, it uh, goes back to theaters four or five times. Well, you told me, I, well, I guess it was Mr. T's play, or no, Lorna played in one drive-in 58 weeks. No, that was Vixen. Vixen. That was in, in, in Elgin, Illinois. It's in the Guinness Book of Records. You realize at that time, too, that, uh, that Elgin only had 14,000 people, so they had to have I've gone seen it many, many times. times. Yeah, yeah. Now, it, let's set up the Mud Honey clip a little, because now this is one that you did after Lorna. Yeah, it followed, uh, it followed uh, Fanny Hill, a picture I did in, in uh, Germany. Journey wasn't a particularly good film. Um, but nevertheless, it was a, a great training ground for me uh, insofar as when I went to Fox, I, I, I could foresee a lot of the problems I might encounter, and it was just marvelous was to have experienced Fanny Hill over there and all the infighting things. And to have nature. worked with Miriam Hopkins. Oh, she was a delight, yeah, she was a delight. One always hears stories about her as a rival of Betty Davis because of their well-publicized yeah. feuds. So yeah. it's nice to know that she was a charming woman and, and uh, no trouble at all, really. Oh, no. She was a, she'd call me Sonny. She, uh, she was married to uh, Fritz, not Fritz Lang, no. He, he told her he was married. <laughs> they were married. I, we won't have to go into that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they went across the country on the super chief and he said, I want to marry you. And uh, so he got a preacher. Uh, only the preacher was an actor, so he had uh, 
taking his pleasures with Miss Hopkins for four some days, and then he told her when the train got into Chicago, he said, uh, he's not really a preacher and we're not married, you know? Ain't show business grand. <laughs> <Love> <laughs> okay, well, let's take a look. Well, at, I mean, just uh, Mud okay, Honey yes. was a film I did after that, and I brought a young lady over from Germany, uh, Rena Horton, really a remarkable beauty, and uh, she played a deaf mute. The reason I changed the script to a deaf mute is that she had a very heavy German accent. And in spite of being in a Rushmeyer movie, which anything can generally happen, I just didn't feel it would wash in the Depression era in a town called Spooner, Missouri. Spooner, Missouri. So I made her a deaf mute, and it was better. It was better for the film. What's wonderful about doing things like that off the cuff, you know, deciding you're going to do it another way. Okay, so now we'll look at a clip of Russ Meyer's Mud Honey. What's the matter? Why isn't everybody singing? Oh, that's all gathered at the river. Don't want to sing, huh? All right, let's tell stories. You heard the one about the traveling city boy and the farmer's niece? Well, the farmer's niece, you silly. Oh, Sydney, for God's sake. Shut up. <laughs> I'm going to do to you what I should have done a long time ago. I'm going to tear the living guts out of you. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of This is what I suppose Roger Ebert called your gothic period of filmmaking when you were doing black and white pictures and they all had a kind of moral. In other words, at, at one point, if, if people had pleasure illicitly or whatever, they always had to pay the piper at the end. And so these, all these characters you know, have to come to certain realizations by the end of the last reel. But now you were telling me something very interesting about one of the, uh, the the actor that wound up being uh, Jay, Jay North's guardian? Yeah, that's Hal Hopper. Uh, he, he was uh, with the Modern Airs, was uh, backing Sinatra, you know, it was a group of singers that sang behind Sinatra in his early career. Mm -hmm. And also Hal was a marvelous uh, writer of music, composer of music. Mm -hmm. uh, there Is No You is one of an all-time standard that he had written. And he'd been a stuntman and also Jay North's, uh, you know, uh, guardian. Um, and um, through uh, another actor, James Griffith, I did meet Hal. Hal first worked for me in Lorna, played the, the dirty, bad, rotten <laughs> Luther, you know. <laughs> See you here he plays uh, sicko Sidney, you know. And um, it's a Depression era thing, uh, based on a book called Streets Paved with Gold by Raymond Friday Locke, and the script was done by William Sprague. Um, I, I, I took it. Uh, as, a, as being a viable subject. I must confess at this time I was very infatuated with a young girl by the name of Rena Horton, plays the deaf mute. And I really wanted to have a good excuse to bring her to the States. And uh, there happened to be two rather voluptuous blondes that uh, needed to be cast in the film. And so I said, why not? I, why don't I make a film like this? But more I got into it, the, the, the carnal need kind of was <laughs> shoved aside and I really concentrated on making the film. And it turned out uh, to be a very successful film eventually, but not in the beginning. This is one of four films that Ebert always refers to as the Gothic period. The Goth it started first with Lorna, then Mud Honey, then a picture called Motorcycle, and then uh, Faster Pussycat Kill Kill, which is now a powerhouse. Which is, is one of the great yeah. cult films of, of all time. The uh, impression I get, of course, is that now you're, you're kind of inadvertently or whatever developing a stock company of actors not and, unlike uh, not unlike Roger Corman, who t continued to use the same actors. Well, I had a, a good helpmate, uh, George Costello, who's now a successful art director. We called him his band of players, more or less. <laughs> and he was always ringing in these people on me, but they were always good. They were always terribly good. Stuart Lancaster, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, marvelous. Now, the the way Faster Pussycat came into being was. How, could you tell me how you came to know Tora Satana? Well, first of all, I made a picture called Motorcycle, and we had three bad boys. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it was successful. It was a drive-in type picture. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, why don't we do it with three girls? And so I, Atura Satana was the only girl that could possibly play Marla. And uh, she, not only possessing, you know, a capacious bosom, she knew karate and judo. Oh, so that was all real. I yeah, that's for real. You know, you couldn't double this girl anyway with her figure. You know, I couldn't have found anyone. Besides, she was oriental. Uh, she told me anyway that she was, her mother was a Cherokee Indian and her father was a Japanese chef in Chicago. And she did a fantastic job. Just a oh, well, and that's the uh, basis of it. It's probably the closest thing that I've come to doing a horror film. You know, we were discussing that last night. Yes. You know, she's like the evil, horrific person that you uh, actually, you know she's going to die. But Somewhere not like, before a lot of other people. No, but, you, <laughs> but you're rooting for her, that she doesn't mm -hmm. die. It's a curious thing. Well, there are a few women, in, in, especially even in the horror film, you know, in, in the horror film you've got your Karloffs and your Lugosis, but there are very few women that achieve that kind of status. There are a lot of women like Yvette that have played uh, victims mm -hmm. or maybe a bad girl who, as you did in Giant Leeches. But you know, in, in David Hogan's book about uh, the dark romance, he mentions just this point you're talking about in Leeches and in the 50-foot woman that they knew, you know I'm going to get punished for this kind of abandonment or having free love or whatever it was right, called. that was the days. time. Yeah, and, and so in a way I think that's why people like these films now, they're kind of enjoying that innocence, the whole idea that you had to get punished for... Well, this woman, Tora Satana, was more... I mean, beyond a cartoon uh, kind of a villainess, you know, you, would, you wouldn't see anything like her until the leather comics of the 60s, which would, of course would be great fodder for a film, uh, because when I first saw Faster Pussycat, I couldn't get over this woman. I mean, she literally, from the minute she came on camera, you were riveted by whatever she was going to do. And I also love the black and white. A lot of people now, you know, we've got all this colorization going on and everything, but to make a black and white movie and give it a certain look, like especially you did in Faster Pussycat, you know, I, I almost prefer it to color sometimes. But now why don't we take a look at the woman we've been talking about, uh, Tora Satana and Russ Meyer's Faster Pussycat, Kill Kill. Oh, give. You the knife.
Jesus. This sequence that we just saw, uh, Russ just told me, had been lifted and used in The Spy Who Loved Me uh, with Richard Kyle taking over for the young man being run in by the Porsche. So it seems like other filmmakers, whether they, they it, sometimes it can even be unconscious, will look at a scene and it will be so compelling that they have to use it sometime themselves. Oh, it's flattering. Yeah, okay. of course. It's All a great. It. Now, I want to, we're running out of time because this has just yeah. flown by, but I want to thank Yvette. Uh, for taking time out to come down here because you've always been a sweetheart for things oh, like that. It's so and good to, to reunite you too with yeah. Russ. And Russ, I, I want you to stick around because, you know, the, my favorite cult film aside from Pussycat is Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. So we'll talk about that in my next show. But now we're going to close with Super Vixen by Russ Meyer. So until next time, may all your nightmares be in 70 millimeter. Yeah!